ICG Media presents High Tech Sunday. On today's episode of High Tech Sunday, our hosts, Rayondon Kennedy and Lango Dean, sit down with the Vice President of Safety and Quality for Boeing Global Services and 2022 Bayer STEM Conference Professional Achievement and Industry Awardee, Philip June, for a conversation on building a diverse workforce. Up first, is Career Communication Group's Managing Editor, Rayondon Kennedy. Next is Career Communication Group's Senior Technology Editor, Lango Dean. Finally, our esteemed guest, Philip June. Prior to his role as Vice President of Safety and Quality, June most recently served as Director of Engineering for the Boeing Commercial Airplanes Engineering Design Center in Southern California and leader for Boeing Global Services Commercial Modifications and Conversions Engineering Team. He was responsible for the core Boeing Commercial Airplanes Engineering Organization and was the engineering skill leader in Southern California for the team, designing and developing commercial airplane programs. In his Boeing Global Services role, June led the team supporting the conversion of airplanes in the Boeing commercial fleet to cargo configurations. He was also site leader for the Boeing facility in Long Beach, California. And without further delay, High Tech Sunday, featuring Rayondon Kennedy and Lango Dean. Thank you for that great intro, Brandon, and welcome everyone to another episode of High Tech Sunday. Uh, we were just discussing with the team that this episode is actually episode 50, which is a great, huge milestone for High Tech Sunday. And it is our honor to have uh, Boeing's Philip June here with us. Welcome to the show, uh, Philip. Thanks, Rand, and, and really congratulations to you and the team on 50 episodes. Really, thank you for really the special milestone. Yeah, we really appreciate it. It's a lot of hard work. We've had a lot of great people, and, and I, we, we know that, that adding you is, is really just going to add to the legacy of the show. Yeah, well, hey, don't set the bar too high, my left. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is awesome. So as we're recording this, we're, we're a couple of days out from, from the holiday season. You know, are you ready for, for, for uh, all the festivities that come along with that? Yeah, you know, it's been a busy year for me and the family. I've got three kids and a, and a fantastic wife. Uh, so we will try and keep it a little low key. We live not too far from the beach, so we'll do our normal sort of, you know, uh, covered up walk along the beach and, and be able to spend some good time together. So I'm looking forward to the time to, to recover and, and really reflect on 2021 and then look forward to what 2022 has in store. Yeah, I picked up on that subtle flex right next to the beach. This sounds like it would be an amazing holiday season. Yeah, no, it's, it's living next to the beach is great. Man. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we always do for High Tech Sunday to kick it off uh, when, when, when I'm here is I call it the origin story. I'm a big superhero fan, big superhero buff, and I always like to think that our guests are our superhero. And so to kick it off, we want to know a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about Philip June and, and who you are and kind of how you got started in the field. What's, what's your backstory? Yeah, well, so I am, I am a Georgia boy. Grew up in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Uh, I was born in, in Alabama. My parents are, are from Alabama originally, uh, but moved to, to Stone Mountain uh, when I was around seven or eight years old. Um, you know, got an older brother, older sister. Uh, parents were obviously big on education and sports and overall just being well-rounded. Uh, went to a, a magnet school that uh, had a great set of academic programs and, and was really rigorous. Uh, I'd say was a vestige of the, the whole sort of minority to majority sort of busing programs uh, that were prevalent back in those days in, in Georgia. And so I've got my own sort of origin story around taking two buses to get to school every morning, waking up super early, uh, you know, the whole walking up hill both ways kind of thing. Um, but that really in, instilled in me this incredible, what I think is, has been an incredible work ethic uh, to just continue to move forward and meet whatever challenge uh, is in front of you. So grew up in, in Stone Mountain, uh, went on to Georgia Tech uh, as a mechanical engineer 
and really had a love for aerospace going back to my high school days uh, after watching a number of, of space shuttle launches and, and having some engagements with folks that have been in the military, mostly pilots. Uh, and that's what really started to stoke that love for me for the aerospace industry. I was fortunate enough to land a cooperative sort of student position with uh, NASA from my freshman and sophomore years uh, at Johnson Space Center down uh, in Houston, Texas. And so that was just a tremendous experience working with astronauts in, in what was called Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility. Uh, I got a chance to dive and help train astronauts in what at the time was the world's biggest pool uh, called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Uh, got a chance to sit in mission control. And so you can imagine at a young age, being able to sort of see your dreams fulfilled uh, really set me on a path to, to open my mind to the possibility that what I worked hard for, uh, what I prayed for, and what I set my intentions behind, I could achieve. So I uh, did that for a few years in, in college and then uh, graduated from Georgia Tech and started uh, with the Boeing Company in 2006 uh, in Ridley Park, uh, Philadelphia, just outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Uh, we work on helicopters there. So started as a structures analyst on CH-47 Chinook helicopter blades. Um, that was an interesting experience and really was the first time I figured out that I had agency around uh, being able to move around a really large company uh, and focusing more on where my strengths align me and, and doing work uh, that really supported those strengths and my growth. So I uh, moved to a different group and, and got a chance to work on some proprietary programs, but then quickly moved to South Carolina, where I met my wonderful wife. And, and at the time, she had a six-year-old, so he's 17 now. Uh, so the three of us all got married. I was working on the 787 uh, Dreamliner down there in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, at that time, moved into my first leadership position uh, as a first-line leader for our stress uh, liaison group that was working to support production uh, on the 787 F section. Um, and then had an opportunity to move to Southern Italy and work there for three years with our supplier slash partner uh, on other sections of the 787. A great cultural experience, not only for me, but also for my family. So a different element of diversity there to the extreme, just being immersed in that culture. I uh, really love Southern Italy and uh, the time that I had there. Uh, we had two children there, so we left as three, came back as five, repatriated to the United States a few years later, uh, and landed in, in Southern California, uh, where I worked to support uh, the fleet of 737 uh, flying around for our customers as a structural uh, leader, uh, supporting that fleet, did well enough there. I was asked to uh, interview for a senior manager position to cover the twin out fleet, uh, which at the time was about 7,000 airplanes flying around. Uh, so won that job and, and really grew uh, pretty substantially from a leadership perspective of 150 engineers, seven first line leaders, uh, and did that for nearly two years and then was asked to interview for my first executive position as program manager for the Boeing Converted Freighter Program. Uh, and did that. Uh, we launched the first 737-800 uh, passenger freighter conversion in aviation history, at least to my knowledge. And so that was a tremendous accomplishment for, for the team. And then was asked pretty quickly after that to go lead a uh, fuselage team, development team for a new airplane offering up in Seattle. So my family and I packed up yet again and moved to Seattle for 18 months where I was able to lead that, that team. Uh, the airplane program was not launched, but I learned a ton, again, just about different ways of, of leading and learning from others um, and really coaching uh, the next sort of generational workforce in future technology. And then was asked to interview for a senior director position back, back here in Southern California, and that's uh, the intro that Brandon read, I ran the SoCal Design Center, about a thousand engineers doing all sorts of stuff around the globe. 
and then just crossed about a year milestone for being vice president of safety and quality for our global services business. Uh, I've got uh, approximately 1,000 individuals across 88 global sites working on safety and quality and, and quality assurance and compliance. So it has been a, an incredible ride in 15 years. Uh, there's two things that I grade myself on from a leadership perspective that are really rooted in my purpose as a leader and my spiritual belief uh, that leadership should be all about service. Uh, the first sort of metric I take on myself every day is that I care about people and not fake it. That is a way to demonstrate and walk out my faith, but also ensure that the team has everything that they need and really fulfilling my duty of care for them. And then the second metric I take uh, beyond caring about people and not faking it is when someone asks you for help, then you help. Know, it's just that simple. When you've got so many folks across so many different locations, somebody's always in need of some sort of help. And so having a strong set of executives that follow those same values, that live out those same values, I think that's really how we make a difference in the workplace and really make the workplace more human. Uh, and create the conditions for people to do their best work. That's my that's my origin story, man. I'm sticking to it. Hey, I, I like it because what you just laid out there really proves that you really are a superhero. You really are a leader, a uh, 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 man of the man of the people, if you will. Uh, there's a couple of things I kind of want to I want to go go back and just touch on uh, while while we was there. And first being, you know, you said you you went to Georgia Tech and you got your degree in mechanical engineering. What made you choose mechanical engineering? Well, you know, I can remember having a conversation with my father about the type of engineer I wanted to be. Um, you know, the conversation in my house was, even though my parents were engineers, it was, you can be anything you want to be. You can be a mechanical engineer. You can be an aerospace engineer. You can be an industrial engineer, right? You can be a biomedical engineer. But it was pretty clear you need to be an engineer, at least to start. And so at the time, aerospace was pretty narrow. Uh, just starting out for me. And so mechanical offered a little bit more broad perspective and a, a bit more broad training, just in case aerospace wasn't the route I wanted to go. So it left me the most options. Uh, and so that's why I chose mechanical engineering. And, and that's, that's awesome. And I think that was really, really uh, important for the young people who are listening to hear just to kind of figure out, you know, there's a lot of ways you can go with engineering, but, you know, you had a lot more options, you know, choosing mechanical engineering. And so uh, uh, you gave us a lot about your, your backstory. And so my next question is, what is your passion? You know, what gets you up in the morning to, to get going and, and just attack the day? Yeah, you know, it really is about serving people as best I can. Um, there's an intersection with being able to work in this great industry for the world's largest aerospace company. Um, but it always starts and ends with the people. Um, the, the joy that I get from uh, leading the right way, from being able to be a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, being a champion for innovation, uh, being able to help our, our customer uh, meet their goals and missions. Uh, in global services, we work on everything from uh, software to help uh, arrange uh, crew rotations for airlines, all the way to uh, modifications on F-18s and C-17s and, and uh, military platforms. So there's a large component of this that is not just about service to uh, my team, but also service to uh, mankind and, and the greater good that's out there. So that's a big component of it for me. And also, uh, really just being able to get up and know that I've got uh, challenging and fulfilling work ahead of me every day. Uh, the aerospace industry is not complicated, it's complex. And the work that we do is highly technical. Uh, there's a lot at stake. It is clearly um, very serious business, but a real privilege to, to work in this industry, even through tough times. But it's also you know, becoming more and more uh, fulfilling to me to be a part of what I hope will be the greatest comeback story in aerospace in history for for the Boeing company. So, you know, I'm an early riser, and um, 
it's really, it's really about those things for me. Yeah. So one of the cool things about High Tech Sunday is, is it gives uh, our guests the opportunity to, to kind of touch on that spirituality. I know you touched on it uh, a little bit, but uh, my next question for you is how does your spirituality uh, influence your day? I know you talked about serving others and kind of having that as your drive, but how does your spirituality play into that? Yeah, well, you know, Colossians 3.17, um, that verse talks about in whatever you do in word or deed, uh, doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus and, and giving thanks to God, uh, the Father through him. And so uh, for me, it really is about bringing honor to uh, the way the Lord created me and the gifts that he's given me the opportunities he's given me. And so uh, I want to make sure that I, uh, God willing, never reach my full potential because there's all, there'll always be more uh, that I can do in his name. Uh, the service piece of that is so fundamental to uh, how I try, how I show up. Uh, when it comes to integrity and decision-making, whether it's relative to uh, personnel safety decision or uh, solving some complex um, quality compliance question or issue. Um, all that plays into to the way I feel the Lord's called me in these various positions and matching uh, the abilities he's given me with the moment. Um, as you can tell from my origin story, I haven't had a, any one job for a really extended period of time, which means that I've got to learn quickly um, and I've got to gain the trust of the folks on my team uh, fairly quickly. And I think the best way to do that is to, is to walk the talk and to care about them and not fake it and to give them help uh, when, when they ask for it. And so that, that really is deeply rooted in, in my purpose uh, in what I feel is my purpose uh, for being on this planet, which is to, do amazing things to help mankind and, and lead with, uh, with integrity and, and character and, and service being at the heart of that. That's, that's awesome. And I think this is probably one of my, one of my favorite uh, backstories so far, you know, like I said, it's episode 50, but uh, I think, I think we got to know you very well. We might be family at this point. <laughs> hey, I'm all in, man. You know, stop by for Christmas. Uh, you by the beach. I might, I might take you up on that. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yeah. So, Mr. June, episode 50, we want to dive into the topic that we were talking about, uh, building a diverse workforce. But before we, we dive in and really start digging into to, to the, the meaning and, and, the, and the thoughts around that, uh, I have to first congratulate you on being a Bay of 2022 uh, Professional Achievement Awardee. I mean, that's a major achievement. You know, it is it is a little surreal, right? I mean, I'm 39, and so getting a, a professional achievement award um, in industry to me is like, you know, writing a biography or autobiography, you know, in my 30s. Um, yeah. I've got a lot of game left uh, to play, but, you know, as with any award, it's great to be acknowledged, and I'm looking forward to being able to use the award to help uh, help others and, and be uh, whatever example I can be for uh, more people of color uh, to get into the aerospace industry and continue to, to fulfill their dreams. So it's an honor and, um, you know, really is going to has set the tone for these last few months and, and for my upcoming year, just deepens my resolve to do everything I can to continue to, to move us forward in the industry. It's like you said, Mr. June, uh, you got to keep building on successes. So 39, you already got the professional achievement. It's, it's just, you know, Black Engineer of the Year next. I'm going to put it out there. You heard it here first. Hey, my, my boss, Ted Colbert, got that award this year. So, um, you know, I got, I got big shoes to fill, and he's a, a great leader, a great mentor for me. Um, yeah. Does it exactly the way it's supposed to be done, at least in my opinion. And so, yeah, I'm in, I'm in the right place at the right time. Absolutely, absolutely. And we had a conversation with Mr. Colbert, also uh, amazing guy. It's, it just seems like Bowen is just, you know, has a really great team over there and, and really doing some amazing things. And so kudos to kudos to Boeing. 
I appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. All right. So let's let's dive into the into the topic: building a diverse workforce. Now, when you talking about the first thoughts that come to mind when we talk about building a diverse workforce might be ethnicity, building a diverse, you know, people of color uh, workforce, but that's not always the, the definition. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what you meant when you wanted to talk about when you're talking about building a diverse workforce? Yeah, you know, there's there's the elements and dimensions of, of diversity that you just mentioned around ethnicity, background, race, uh, obviously gender. Uh, but there's also another whole set of dimensions uh, that make people diverse uh, in their experience, in their background, in the way that they think, uh, but also in the way that they learn. And so with uh, the demographics changing as they are, not just in the aerospace industry, but across a uh, multitude of industries, I think it's really important that we think about diversity not only in the sort of standard dimensions, but also as it relates to how individuals learn and process information. Uh, in the aerospace industry, like I mentioned in, in many others, we are seeing uh, a seismic shift around uh, demographics, largely around age and gender for that matter. But with that comes the responsibility, I think, for me as a leader, certainly, to focus on creating a psychologically safe environment for our diverse folks to come in to the workforce. And so it's not just about diversity. I'll take it a step further. The, the notion of inclusion is, in a lot of ways, even more important than diversity itself. For us to actually see the benefits of having a diverse workforce and a diverse set of teammates, you need to make sure, or at least I focus on making sure that I'm able to actually hear from these people and being able to, to speak out about what's important about our values, uh, listening to the experiences that they're having uh, as they join the team, as they do their work, uh, but then also being able to, as I mentioned, create this psychologically safe environment for them to do their best work and be fulfilled in the work that they do. Uh, these are all important components of diversity. It doesn't just stop at making sure that the individuals in the room are diverse in those sort of classical dimensions, but it also is important to understand how they learn, how they process information, how they think and then being able to help them bring all that forward. Because ultimately, that leads to uh, better performing businesses, more fulfilled uh, employees, more innovation, happier customers. These things are not theoretical. There's plenty of studies that show that diverse and inclusive teams perform better in the marketplace. So I don't view having a diverse workforce uh, and a diverse set of team members as something that's sufficient to achieve better uh, business results, I would believe it's truly a business necessity. And the companies that do this well going forward in the future uh, will perform well in the marketplace and excel. And the ones that don't will not. It's just that simple to me. I think you just asked my next question, would be, which was going to be uh, why is having a diverse team and having that diverse workforce that's diverse be trained uh, why is that important? But you just kind of laid it out. It, it just improves everything that that your company's doing. Whether you know, uh, it just improves everything that that you guys are doing on on a, on a scale. Um, if you can close your eyes and just imagine immediately, just have the ideal diverse team. What what would that look like? And, and yeah, what would that look like? It would look like um, a multi generational sort of multicultural group of folks that have diverse backgrounds from across a different set of functions and industries. Uh, it would also include differently abled individuals that may have, you know, differences that we can or, or cannot see. Uh, because, you know, when you think about somebody with dyslexia or some other sort of difference, that generates a different sort of wiring in their mind that helps them come at problems and, and possible solutions in a different way. And so it really would be 
a cornucopia, if you will, of all the different ways in which we are diverse. And, you know, I'll just go back to the, the question that you asked briefly around the why. You know, aside from generating uh, better business results and better business outcomes and growth and all those things, it's also morally the right thing to do. Uh, the, the makeup of the globe really is trending in a completely different direction, I think, than it has been, uh, than, than maybe we're all prepared to understand. And so there's significant strength in embracing diversity and, and being more inclusive in creating equitable opportunities for all. And so uh, from a moral perspective, it is in a spiritual perspective, it's the right thing to do. When we're talking about building a more diverse workforce, we're talking about diversifying the training and kind of learning uh, uh, the teams that are around us and being able to kind of uh, meet them where they're at. And so I know a large part of the conversation in our, in our pre-meeting was around learning styles. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just a, a personal uh, sort of comment on that. My, my fantastic, beautiful, wonderful wife, who's also an engineer, is homeschooling our youngest two children. And we often talk about uh, how that's going, you know, because she's simultaneously sort of the, the wife, the mom, the teacher. So she's got a lot on her plate. She's, she's fantastic. Uh, but she's been doing a lot of research on learning styles because my children are quite different in the way that they learn. And so that got me thinking about the way that uh, our team members at the company learn. I'd say that largely learning has been deployed in one predominant way, and that's been a student sits down at a desk and a teacher teaches from a blackboard or a PowerPoint presentation. And it is largely just the singular way that we have come to understand learning and corporate training, uh, although it includes a, a large on-the-job training component, is heavily uh, composed of this sort of classroom learning style. There's a case to be made that this is not the way that most people learn. Depending on, on the research you do, uh, there are four different types of learners. Uh, some say seven. So some are best learned through auditory uh, means. Some are visual or spatial. Some folks learn verbally, uh, but some per folks are physical learners or kinesthetic learners. Some folks learn best in groups. Some learn best individually. And so it's my belief that if we can first understand uh, how someone best learns, then they're more likely to actually engage the information, engage the opportunity, and retain the knowledge that you're trying to pass on to. So it's not just diversity in, again, the classical ways that we think about, but it's also diversity in learning styles. And so I've been thinking a lot about this lately because, as I mentioned, demographic shifts uh, in our industry means that we have uh, less experienced folks doing really difficult jobs in, in some cases. And in some cases, the individuals that have been doing those jobs for 20 or 30 years are no longer there to train them. And so the effectiveness of uh, training and learning is, I think, one of the biggest challenges of our time, not just in the aerospace industry, but across a number of industries, but especially when you think about what's been happening recently here with COVID and the pandemic's impacts on uh, the, the labor market. Month over month, we've seen close to four or five million people resigning from their job, and they're not necessarily leaving the workforce, but they are moving to a different job, in some cases, they are leaving the workforce. And so what I see from this as a result of this is not only a very sort of intense and high level of knowledge transfer, uh, but also a need to for a better way to train and engage folks in learning. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about learning types lately and, and how that intersects with uh, diversity. And so 
it's not just the learning types, but also reinforcing the learning uh, through nudging and gamification and, and sort of psychological behavior and thinking about it more from a technical side of things and less from just your sort of standard basic classroom learning. What you just said was 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 very, very, uh, very important. And whether you're talking about Boeing or where you're talking about schools, a lot of these places, no matter what company, are kind of have this built in system. You know, you know, these SOPs that, that have kind of been around for, for many years and kind of, you know, talking to one specific learning style or one specific, you know, form. So how do you implement these changes? So how do you start to kind of change the narrative or change the culture to kind of open up and kind of allow these different learning styles or, or adapt the, the lessons to fit these different learning styles, whatever, whatever it is that, that's being taught? Right. Well, you know, in my opinion, I think step one is to first assess and evaluate what type of learning style an individual may have. And there are lots of assessment tools and questionnaires available to do that. Uh, you can take learning style inventories and, and other types of things. So that, for me, that's step one. And, um, you know, that's something that I think is absolutely necessary. Uh, the second uh, step, I think, is something that uh, the Boeing Company has been engaged with in large measure uh, out in the community. And that has to do with being able to plan ahead, if you will, to develop the next generation of, uh, of teammates that will be coming into the company. You know, just in 2020 alone, the Boeing Company contributed close to $50 million across 276 grants in support of STEM education and workforce development programs. And so it's not just understanding where you know, the next generation of, of workforce is going to come from and assessing and being able to influence what their learning environment looks like, uh, but it's also making tangible, concrete investments in building that pipeline. Because we, we've got a set sort of workforce that we've got to obviously care and feed and nurture and grow, and we do that. But I think it's also important to, to be looking forward and to have a, a positive influence uh, on the communities in which we, we live and work. So between those two things, uh, what I'd sort of, sort of wrap that all in is, again, creating an environment where uh, people can have a growth mindset and make sure that they know uh, that they don't have to know everything right now and that they can be continuous learners. Uh, and then, you know, making sure that they understand that learning agility is important, it goes right along with growth mindset. And so uh, we talk a lot about capabilities inside the company right now. And so we are focused on building the capabilities of not just our business, but also of our people. So I'm gonna change, change gears a little bit and kind of, kind of bring it back to you. Like I said earlier, you're, you're it's based off the background of origin story. You're you're sound like you're an amazing leader, and we know you're an amazing leader because you know you get an award and, and you're here talking to us with, with us. How does your leadership style and your work? And you did touch on it a little bit, but how do you how do you lead? Like, what's your leadership style, and how do you influence and, and kind of inspire your team? Well, the first thing I try and do is I I put the work in, and so I I read a lot and I learn a lot. Uh, based on my origin story, you know, I mentioned that I haven't had a job, a single job, longer than, than three years. And so that means in an order for me to lead, I've got to learn quickly, be able to build strategies and tactics and, and objectives quickly, understand the team quickly, and then get out in front as quickly as I can. So learning agility is something I just mentioned, and that really speaks to, I think, my broader style just around service. But from a learning perspective, I ask a lot of questions. And they, I try and make sure they're informed questions. Uh, and I encourage people at all levels to engage with me uh, if they are the experts or if they are the, the ones doing the work, then I want to hear straight from them and ask them questions as much as possible. And honestly, try and break down some of uh, the power distance index that can exist in large uh, companies. I do believe that it's important for me to know people's names, uh, 
Um, I have a lot of roundtables when I go out across uh, the many sites that I have an opportunity to serve. And so uh, I, I hear directly from the folks doing the work on a regular basis. And that helps me inform the strategy. Um, I was uh, a first line leader uh, for five years or six years or so. And so I still think about in a lot of ways if what I am uh, proposing from a strategic perspective or from a vision perspective, if my first line leaders uh, can't understand it and put it in their own words and flow it down to the team, then it means I need to go back and restructure uh, what what my hypotheses are on on where the the team needs to go. So I try and be uh, not only grassroots but also uh, engage a lot with the folks doing the work, and that's really my style. I mean, I I like to be available uh, not just for my team to to be able to get time on my calendar, but also folks outside my team. Um, as you can imagine, I get a lot of requests for uh, mentorships and, and conversations, informational interviews. And, you know, I, I largely never say no to those opportunities. And so I want to be accessible. I want to make sure that I guard against uh, what can sometimes happen as you continue to move up in the company is there's a distance that's created. Uh, and you, you get, there's, there's the risk that you get more removed from what people are experiencing and so i build into my cadence uh risk mitigation against that uh, but ultimately you know i don't know that there's any other um, uh, model for leadership other than servant leadership i can't think of one that is actually uh universal and has worked and you know yielded consistent results over the last you know 15 20 30 years so it sounds like you, you, you put the work in, you be flexible, and, and you and you attend you tend to uh, uh, the needs of of your uh, of your team. Yeah, you know, it, it really is just kind of that simple. Um, by putting the work in, you know, you, you read as much as you can, you learn as fast as you can, you look look forward in terms of what's coming, being able to to look around some corners if you can, and and position the team properly. Um, you know. All of that is is about putting the work in and, and thinking through uh, what the right thing is for the company and for for the folks that you serve. So there's more often than not uh, an intersection there, uh, and that's the sweet spot. Yeah, and, and it works. And it works. Uh, a little bit about my background is I, I played uh, sports all through college, and that that was the way. I mean, whether if it if it was me leading the, the the younger classmen underneath me or just following the upperclassmen the tone of, of the organization is set by the leaders and so you got to be the person i was trying to be the person that everybody sees and so yeah that that totally works whether you're playing football or you're, you're, you're working in the industry before i pass it over to, to lango you touched on something that i wanted to kind of get your thoughts on because we talk about mentorship here a lot on high tech sunday and so what I want to ask uh, before I pass it over is, uh, I, I'm sure, you know, as much as you are a mentor to younger or to other uh, 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 folks, uh, you also have mentors. And so what is the best advice that, that you live by that you receive from one of your mentors or favorite? Oh, wow. You know, I've, I've had a lot of great mentors and have a lot of great mentors. Um, you know, I've, I've had one mentor who's had a great career, continues to have a great career, um, told me to enjoy the ride. I don't know that we talk about fun enough at work. I don't know that we talk about joy enough. Um, and in an industry that can be real challenging and can be honestly sometimes heart wrenching. Um, you know, playing with joy and enjoying the ride really helps keep things in perspective. So I'd say that that's the, the bit of advice that I'm most uh, thinking about now is how to how to trust and obey and, and play with joy. That's awesome. Work hard, play hard. That's right. <laughs> All right, Philip, I'm going to be right back. Right now, I'm going to pass it over to Lango. 
and then I'll be back with you in, in, in a few to close us out. All right, sounds good. You're listening to High Tech Sunday, featuring Rayon and Kennedy, Lango Dean, and our special guest, Vice President of Safety and Quality for Boeing Global Services and 2022 Bay STEM Conference Professional Achievement and Industry Awardee, Philip June. Now, back to the show. Hi, Mr. June. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, fascinating conversation between the two of you. Um, there was a term that you used, uh, Mr. June, uh, psychologically safe environment. And um, we're talking now about young people who have seen all kinds of things uh, in 2020 and 2021 as they enter a very uh, a workforce, which is changing really rapidly. And we've had national leaders who are saying, well, 90% of the jobs uh, won't require a college degree. We've had some who said that um, to everyone who feels left behind in, in this economy, um, because things are changing so rapidly, uh, the infrastructure bill is for you. But I've heard young people who say, well, this is all coming from people who've had every conceivable advantage in life. Right. Right? So what do you say to young people? What do you, what kind of qualities do you think are important for them to have in this industry? Uh, what tips can you give them to stand out as they prepare to enter the workforce? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I think um, something that not just the aerospace industry, but the, the United States and the world's going to have to continue with. Uh, but I'd say from a qualities perspective, you know, there's a few things. I talked about learning agility, which I define as uh, one's ability to acquire knowledge, but not just acquire the knowledge, but apply it effectively in, in whatever uh, work they're doing. And so learning agility is going to be important. The speed at which new technology comes online or the speed at which they're going to have to process all the, the deluge of information that comes at all of us uh, these days. I think that's going to be a critical component. The other, uh, one of the other qualities that I think they've got to have is really about teamwork. And it sounds a little sort of status quo, but not one of us is as smart as all of us. And so having the ability to work in an inclusive way with folks that are not like you, uh, that might think differently than you, uh, but to collectively work to get to the mutual outcome uh, and, and meet the mutual object objective, I think is, is going to be super important. So learning agility, uh, being able to, to work on a team. And then I think there's also this element of really understanding and having wisdom as it relates to when there's a solution, uh, a technological solution versus when a person is best suited uh, to do the job. So if you think about, um, you mentioned that, you know, 90% of the jobs going forward may not require a college degree. Um, that may be true, but if you think about from a manufacturing perspective, we want highly skilled, highly educated mechanics. This, I think society and, and as a whole has spent a lot of time over the last few decades uh, sort of demanding that everyone go to college to be successful, uh, when in actuality, there are lots of meaningful and needed trades and vocations that societies need to be helpful and to be healthy. And so uh, when I think about uh, just education as a whole and the importance of knowing when uh, you need somebody to physically do something versus an automated solution. You know, robots kind of get a, a bad rap, but ultimately there's work, certainly in our industry, in my industry, uh, that requires a person to do the work. And so knowing when there's a physical solution versus 
a personal solution. I think it's, it's probably a, a set of tools and skills that the next generation is going to need to have. There's not always uh, a fancy tech solution uh, for everything. So learning agility, understanding how to work on teams, and then striking this balance between tech and, and people uh, are the three qualities I'd say will help set them up for success. Thank you. Let's drill down now on this term that's bandied about all the time, blue collar jobs. Um, what are they? Uh, why do we need them? I mean, politicians are talking about them. Um, uh, manufacturing leaders are talking about them. How can, and you've talked about training and learning agility and teamwork. How do people do better training and recruiting workers who don't want to go to college, who can't afford to go to college, but who need to be trained, highly skilled to do those jobs, those trades and vocations that you mentioned? Yeah, well, I think it starts by changing the way that, that we talk about the quote, blue collar job. Um, I can tell you right now that from my perspective, my company, uh, the Boeing company has to be uh, on the cutting edge in the front sort of line of getting the most highly skilled, diverse set of mechanics that we can to help build these complex and, and fantastic machines that we build. But I think we, we start by changing the way that we talk about it. But I think we also uh, can go to places that have not normally uh, been visited by companies like Boeing. Uh, diverse neighborhoods, diverse community centers, uh, working with communities, local governments, local nonprofit agencies, working with veterans to uh, make sure that they know what opportunities are available. Uh, there are all sorts of trade shows and professional organizations that, that we can partner with uh, to make sure that they know uh, what opportunities are available uh, inside the Boeing company. And then once they get inside the company, make sure that we pour into them and that we uh, create every opportunity possible for them to not just be good at their jobs, but to be great at their jobs uh, and, and, and fully engage them in, in everything that we do. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of that the Boeing company does is the level of engagement that we have in the communities across all the 50 states in which we work and truly around the globe. It's something that I think that we do well and will continue to do well. And I'm excited about the, the evolution that we're going through relative to being super diverse and engaging not just uh, our professionals, but also um, our mechanics and, and technicians and, and all those other uh, great professions. Great. Right at the beginning, you talked about having the opportunity to go to a magnet school. Um, and um, on the flip side, when you look at, I don't know if it, you hear a lot about magnet schools still, but you don't hear so much about trade schools and about shop classes, which used to be a big thing, you know, a couple of generations ago. So how can schools, I know you've talked about going into those diverse neighborhoods, um, you know, reaching out to veterans, uh, going to trade shows and professional, seeking the help of professional organizations. But how can schools do a better job, you know, um, helping students within that K to 12 span, you know, get into blue collar jobs if that's what they wanted to do? Well, Lango, I think, you know, partnerships are key for those schools. Uh, to build and expand and promote work-based learning and project-based learning as a means to help K-12 students see alternatives for their futures in the workforce. Uh, project-based learning, for example, is a great way to get a lot of good hands-on experience, really speaks to what I talked about earlier, just around the different ways in which individuals learn. And so I think it's imperative that not just my company that does a fair amount of this, but also uh, other companies across other industries work together with these schools to promote uh, project-based and work-based learning and training. There is, there is another way. Not everyone's 
uh, interested in going to college, as you mentioned, uh, we need folks that know how to be electricians and mechanics uh, and plumbers and all these things. And so um, partnerships, are, I think, are the best way, I think, uh, for these schools to, to grow in this way. Fantastic. I, I love that. that. There is another way and that there always is. Um, this is my last question before I turn it back to, to Ray. And I'm going to flip it a little bit. Um, I know you talked about how Ray asked you about how you became interested in mechanical engineering. And you talked about the conversations that you had um, with your parents, you know, and, and it was quite, uh, you know, uh, and an environment where you could talk about what kind of engineer you wanted to be. So you were quite informed. But if you if you if you weren't a mechanical engineer working for Boeing, um, what else would you have wanted to be? You know, I think uh, a writer of some sort. Um, I used to write a lot as a kid. Um, sometimes when I'm writing, you know, all team meeting remarks or, or statements or white papers or whatever it may be, I really, really enjoy extending ideas and sharing ideas uh, via written word, um, being able to paint pictures for folks. Um, you know, it, it really is something that I enjoy. And I think that's, uh, you know, maybe in another 20 years or whatever, when when this this work is done for me, then, then I'll do a bit of writing. But uh, definitely something that I enjoy and, and hopefully we'll get a, a chance to do more of in the future. That's great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending time in this uh, segment, uh, Mr. Jim. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Ray. Ray? Yeah, that was that was a great segment. So, Mr. June, we, we, we're at the back end of this, and we're going to close it out. And I, and I did just have uh, one one question for you, um, and that was just to kind of get your thoughts on. You worked on a lot of projects. Uh, what has been your favorite? Uh, what has been kind of the most impactful on, on you, or one that you completed, or what has meant the most uh, to you? Yeah, you know, it's a, a great question. Um, I would say, you know, every every job had certainly its, its learning opportunities and different elements that have been quite enjoyable. Uh, but you know, I'll I'll just call out the the opportunity that I have right now being uh, VP of, of Safety and Quality for uh, Global Services. Uh, it really gives me an opportunity to bring together uh, the core values of the company and my core values and work across a diverse team to really do something meaningful, uh, not just for the company, but for the industry uh, as it relates to, to safety and quality. Uh, really important dimensions and values for us to always put at the forefront of everything that we do, not just in the United States, not just in one particular part of the world, but truly in the work that we do around the globe. Um, there's a, a 80%, conservatively, 80% of the world has never flown on an airplane before. Um, and that's just one, one medium that we have. You know, we make great platforms that support the world fighter, uh, working on some really cool stuff uh, in terms of mobility for the future. So, you know, in terms of, of working for a purpose-driven organization and having a, a purpose-driven uh, role in that organization, uh, being Vice President of Safety and Quality for our global services business right now is uh, exactly where I want to be. And I think I'm in the right place at the right time. And it's very, very meaningful. So I'm happy to do this job right now in this time. That's awesome. So um, before we before we get out of here, before I give you the last word, uh, is there any, any uh, plugs that you want to put, any programs that's coming up with Boeing, if, uh, uh, any way, if anybody was touched by this or inspired, any way that they can contact you, social media, uh, you know, whatever you want to, you want to offer. Yeah, you can, you can find me, Philip June on LinkedIn. If you're interested to connect, happy to always hear from folks. Uh, the Boeing company is a huge uh, sponsor and supporter of Black Engineer of the Year Award. So we're looking forward to that in February. Uh, I'm a part of uh, a number of nonprofit organizations 
uh, that I partner with Barney with in terms of uh, work in the community. Uh, there's a great organization out of Compton called Fly Compton uh, that's led by a number of African-American pilots uh, that teach uh, kids from the Compton community how to fly. So really excited about the work that they're doing. Um, you know, I have an opportunity to, to work on a number of different nonprofit boards. Um, City Year Los Angeles is, is a great uh, organization that leverages the near peer model uh, to help uh, kids in, in uh, minority communities uh, be as successful as possible uh, at school. And so these are all uh, great opportunities for me to serve uh, through the Boeing company. And so just uh, really, really excited about the work that we're doing. I appreciate the opportunity to, to plug those few organizations. Thank you. And um, this is the close of the show. And so uh, right now you have the opportunity to kind of leave our audience with, uh, with your final words. You know, first off, thanks for the opportunity to, to be, especially on the 50th uh, podcast, really kudos to you all for the work that you're doing here to, to reach out uh, to the community and to really be advocates uh, for our folks uh, across the industry. So thank you for that. You know, I am, uh, I continue to be optimistic for not only the future of the company that I work for and the industry that I work in, but also for the country. Uh, but it will, uh, nothing's going to be given uh, because power concedes nothing without demand. And so uh, we just got to continue to stay at it um, and dig in for the long haul. But, um, you know, the, the future, in, from my view, is, is really bright um, as long as we, we stay rooted in our values, rooted in our spirituality, help uplift one another um, and care about people. Don't fake it. And when somebody asks you for help, you help them. Just that simple. So thank, thanks for the time. I enjoyed it. Yes. This is a great conversation, Philip. Thank you again. The pleasure is all ours. Um, and thank you to everyone who sat and, and listened to this episode. This is episode 50 of High Tech Sunday. We hope to see you for the next 50. And so once again, you guys have a great uh, holiday season and we'll see you next time. Brandon, over to you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of High Tech Sunday. Career Communications Group's High Tech Sunday looks at professional development and technology through the lens of spiritual philosophies. In a time when digital information is more critical than ever, this weekly program is produced by and for CCG's community of alumni and professionals in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. The community runs from national thought leaders to aspiring students, and this weekly series aims to bring a concentrated discussion around technological advancements and achievements based on universal moral principles. The one-hour podcast will be streamed every Sunday. The podcast can be accessed through the Bay of Facebook page, Women of Color Facebook page, and CCG YouTube page, in addition to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and Spotify. Please join us next time.